Well, hello, everybody. Anfield is gradually emptying after a really intense football match um, between Liverpool and Manchester City, which finished all square. Welcome to the Gary Neville podcast. Uh, and Gary, you look a bit drained. I, I, I actually am drained. I've got a headache. Um, people might at home have a headache listening to me. Um, no, I, honestly, it was a big game. Obviously, we knew that before the game. It just felt like we've watched a real heavyweight clash there where you were just, I don't know, you couldn't take your eyes off it at all, particularly that second half. That was a hell of a performance, second half for Liverpool. I thought City would win here today. I said to you just at, just at half time, didn't I? I think City could regret the way in which they approached the last 15 minutes of the first half. I don't know why they do it here. I don't know why they've not learned. And they're a brilliant team, one of the best we've ever seen. But they went 1-0 up and then they just started to relax on the ball. They started to walk to throw-ins. They started to reduce their tempo and their rhythm that they rely upon. And then you just invite this mayhem and this chaos. I once described this place as being like thrown in a washing machine and being sort of tumbled around. And I've never been put in a washing machine before. I'm just imagining, because that's how it used to be for us sometimes. You can be going okay in a game here and then your world can collapse. And the, just the world caves in all around you. And uh, I look, Liverpool second half were absolutely outstanding. And what a great game. What a great game. And but. I think you said at the end, both managers will be really proud. I think that they, they will be. It's uh, how a big game should be, a really big game should be. That that felt like a, a monster of a match. It might it might seem odd to people, but it's sometimes hard, isn't it, off the back of a game to remember instantly all the moments within the game. You because they get lost in that washing machine. But I'm thinking in that second half in particular, the moments Diaz had, and we shouldn't forget at the other end that. That Doku. Um, Doku. Doku was that far away from winning it. Yeah, I mean, look, that was probably City's one moment in the second half that I can think of. There isn't anything in Haaland. I've never, I mean, we see him quiet, don't we? We see him quiet quite often, but he normally lights up a game. There was nothing from him today. Van Dijk was immense. Kwanzaa did well alongside him. But yeah, Diaz had those, th there was that period, wasn't there, with five minutes where Liverpool had those four or five shots on goal where they should have scored and shouldn't have gone and got the second. And Diaz was just scruffy. As brilliant as he was and as energetic as he was, he was scruffy in his final bit. And the only thing about this City team, they are a machine. And the thing that I sit here now immediately and think is how well Liverpool have done today. But you can't rely upon other teams to go and take points off City. You've got to take them off them yourself. And I don't think anybody will have Manchester City on the ropes. Even like, Arsenal? Arsenal could, but you know it's at the Etihad, so you think, are they going to really have them on the ropes like Liverpool did in the second half? And I think Arsenal can do well at the Etihad, as, as tough as it will be, because I think Arsenal are playing really well. But you think about how anxious, nervous, you know, yeah, on the ropes City were. You, you know, you, it's brilliant to watch actually seeing City like that because they're a team of ultimate composure that you watch every single season, meticulous and melodic in everything that they do and all of a sudden you see them here and it's like they're on a roundabout spinning for like five minutes then they come off and they just don't quite know where they are i said they didn't have the boots on the right feet at one point they just completely can't handle this ground and at the end the city fans behind that goal to a man and woman and kid were up there sort of clapping because they knew they just basically withstood a barrage, an absolute barrage in that second half. And it was it was great to see them, you know, they, they, they stood up to some good set pieces, but it was a hell of a game. What a performance from Liverpool's do, second half. Do you think City were deliberately slightly inhibited today? Do you think that's that's the mindset they came to the game with or, or Liverpool just required that of them? Well, look, I, we know it's a difficult place. We know it's a tough place to play. We know it's a tough place for City to play, the toughest. We know that Klopp's got the best record against... Um, Pep of any manager along with Conte we know that we know all these things but in the first half when Liverpool weren't at it and Liverpool weren't at the best and City were playing and they were getting in those spaces to Bernardo Silva and to De Bruyne and they were feeding Foden quite a bit on that far side you're thinking go on so you get your first goal and the big disappointment I think for City and Pep Guardiola will be from the first goal going in until half time because that's the period of the game where I thought they could have gone for it. But they started walking to throws. I'm repeating myself, but they started ambling in the game, almost like killing the clock. Don't kill the clock here. You can't kill the clock. They won't go quiet this lot. They always come back. So you've just got to go and get that second goal. You've got to believe you need that second, then you need that third. You're never safe. 
you're never safe in this ground. And they go at half time in a decent position. But I think Jurgen Klopp at half time will be not happy, but he'll be thinking, right, OK, we weren't at our best in that first half, but they're only one goal in front of us. And then you know as soon as that mistake happens from Ake and then Edison, you know that all hell is going to break loose. And then you're basically fighting for your lives in the game. So, yeah, I think City, we know what it is. We know it's Anfield. We know it's, I mean, Michael Richards has just described it as a force field around this place <laughs> that exists. We've all been in that, that have experienced Anfield. But to win here, you've just, you can't think you're OK. You can't let moments drift. You can't. You, know, you might let the clock run down with three minutes to go when you, if you were two one up or lucky to, to be two one up, but you can't run the clock down with 60, 65 minutes to go. And that's what I felt City tried to do. They tried to sort of, if you like, kill the game before half time. And they started playing passes and standing, and they stopped making those runs forward into the box that they make alongside Haaland. And then once you stop doing that. All of a sudden, you've got this tidal wave coming towards you. And that's what they had in this second half, this wave of pressure and wave of pressure. And you can't stop it then, because once they have the momentum here at Anfield, it's very difficult then to turn it around. There's not a whole lot more Liverpool could have done, is there? Oh, no. No, no I mean, they were honestly, City are a better team. They've got better players. Liverpool had injuries. So for Jurgen Klopp, to extract that performance from his team in this game is something else, honestly. It really is. He's a, he's a great, great manager. Everybody knows that. But to do that to Manchester City, and I think I saw an interview with him yesterday where he said that I know how to make it uncomfortable for them. And that's what I try and do, is make it uncomfortable for them, make it chaotic for them. And... There's no doubt it works. He has that sort of, if you like, thing about how to play against them. He has no fear. He doesn't step backwards. He goes forwards at them. He punches. They might throw a punch in, but he carries on sort of, if you like, like a warrior. And his team follow him. And yeah, that second half, if you think that they had no Trent Alexander-Arnold out on the pitch, no Canate, obviously Salah wasn't on the pitch. Jota wasn't on the pitch. For, Jota wasn't, Salah wasn't on the pitch for large parts. Jota wasn't on the pitch at all. You know, that, that's, a, that's not a depleted Liverpool side, but it's certainly a weakened Liverpool side that have gone and done that to Manchester City. So credit to them and credit to City in the second half for withstanding the pressure and, and coming out, if you like, with a point. Because a point's respectable here when you've been beat up like that you have in the second half. They were beat up. So Liverpool could not have done any more other than... Look, I'm, I'm not going to criticise the the wastefulness of, of Diaz because honestly what we saw out there today was a player who gave everything and more on the pitch so yeah of course you can talk about that little bit of quality but it's not said with any great negativity I don't we don't none of us feel in that sort of spirit or feeling today yes he should have done better he'll know he should have done better with those two or three moments where his touch wasn't right or his finish wasn't right but he did everything in game other than that little bit of that final bit and it, it, that's that's football sometimes it happens so let's drag Arsenal into it. I know you watched their game against yeah. Brentford last night, which, by the way, they were within four or five minutes of yeah. not winning, You know, which, which suggests as we go into the final stage, they're not all going to be played 10-1-10 over the last stretch. Somebody's going to probably drop points somewhere, not just because City are playing Arsenal, but where do you throw them into? Arsenal are top, by the way, Gary. Yeah. So, so you know, what are you making of that? They're having a great season and they're playing great football and you're always going to have an awkward game. You're always going to need a late winner along the way. I was watching the game intently. Uh, they were comfortable. They were the better team. But Brentford did well. And Brentford had a couple of moments. And the moment, obviously, I think everyone felt for Ramsdale, obviously, what happened just before half-time. But I think that pressure has been building on Ramsdale all season. And it, it, does, it doesn't surprise me that he's in that position and he does that. You know, you think about the fact at the start of the season that he was told, and we were all told, that there were two number ones. But it's not turned out to be the case. He's quite clearly the number two. And he doesn't see himself as a number two. He sees himself as an excellent goalkeeper who shouldn't be watching someone else play. So you know when he does have to come in that there's an, an increased scrutiny, an increased sort of, if you like, feeling around him. So I felt for him. I felt for him a lot. And, you know, he'll be really relieved at the end of the game that obviously that goal went in that uh, Arsenal scored. And I think just generally, I think that you can drop points on a title running and Arsenal will drop points on a title running. Both teams here have dropped points today. 
but they couldn't drop points in that game. They've got some tough games coming up, and I'm not saying that they're going to need a cushion. And the reason I believe that Arsenal have to go to Manchester City and win is because Arsenal do have to go to other grounds. They have to go to Old Trafford. They have to go to Tottenham. They have to go to other places. So I just think you to really change the psyche of this Manchester City team, you've got to damage them yourself. You've got to make them believe that you're better than them. And I always remember we used to feel that we would be champions every single year. So when Arsenal came to Old Trafford in 98, or when they came in the early 2000s and Will Tord scored, 98, it was over Mars. They shook us to the ground and we were stunned. And 75,000 people were stunned. And they walk into the Etihad Stadium, I think, in three weeks today. And they've got to leave, I think, as winners. That's not to say that a draw is never a respectable result at the Etihad. But Manchester City don't tend to make mistakes. We know City's next few games are quite tough, but then that running, they can win every game. That's what they do every single season. So the only way you can really expect to win the league is to take points off them yourself. So Arsenal couldn't afford to drop points against Brentford yesterday. They got the job done. Well done to them. They're top of the league tonight. We've got an excellent couple of months to look forward to. Big game coming up in a few weeks' time. Um, and three really good teams going for it. They've all got different qualities. Arsenal, a growing team, emerging as title contenders last season, got close, but then just fell away at the end. This season, they look more strong, they look more solid, more reliable. Liverpool have got this momentum, this energy, this spirit, this Klopp thing that's going on, this sort of final dance, whatever you call it, last dance. And then you've got Pep Guardiola, the seasoned not just winner, beyond winner, just literally a, a trophy machine. And all three look like they've got something. They've all got to change the mentality of City, though, because City have got the steel. Just finally, and we'll move on quickly to Manchester United at the end. Do you, are you interested by the fact that quirkily we've got in the title race, there is Premier League football next week, but there's this three-week gap. And we're going to have essentially a brand new 10-game season, aren't we? The title race has begun in the sense that this matters today. Um, but after that international break, we always have that international break in March. It's always been there. And that was the international break where Sir Alex Ferguson all of a sudden would find injuries for quite a few of his important players because he didn't like them playing friendlies in March ahead of a title running or a Champions League quarter-final and semi-final. I just wonder how many managers in this next couple of weeks are going to select some players that don't go away with internationals to make sure they're ready for the running. Because when you come back, it, you hit it hard. You hit it really hard and the games come thick and fast and that's when the pressure really builds. The pressure hasn't quite ramped up yet in this title race. We know it happens with sort of eight, nine games to go. We know it's always after that last international break, which will be the end of March, early April, when you think, right, here we go. But there's no doubt that it started a little bit early just because of the fact there's three teams involved and it's so close. And the fact that there's this game today and the game last week, obviously, a big games that you know if Manchester City drop points against United, they drop points here that... You know, you know, there's more, there's more chance for the others to win. So, I think that's why we started just ramping it up a little bit early. But in all essence, it usually starts after this three-week break or two-week break, as it would be. Some important FA Cup games next weekend, a Manchester United Liverpool game next weekend. City play obviously at Newcastle and Arsenal. Interestingly, have a have a have a bit of time off. And they've got a big Champions League game this week. Don't they've forget. Got, yeah, they've got the Champions League, but then they've got two and a half weeks is it without a game. So you just think, how does Mikel Arteta to look at that as a positive? Losing momentum, potentially, losing sight of where his players are. Does he, carry them, does he carry them on training before the internationals or does he give them four or five days off? Interesting, those little think, thoughts. I'm sure he's thinking a lot about it. Obviously, they've got the Champions League game first. But, yeah, no game domestically for a few weeks for Arsenal, which is, is interesting how they handle that. Manchester United, obviously, you've been in the news this week. Um, you might want to talk about the performance, which I know you saw yesterday at Old Trafford, but I think United fans will be interested to hear from the horse's mouth your perspective on all the talk around the Old Trafford Stadium itself and where it's going. Yeah, I mean, what, what's quite clear is that, obviously, I, I, I won't take a role at Manchester United. I've been very critical of the ownership over the last three or four years. Um, and not that I've been offered a role at Manchester United, I haven't. But what I've always been incredibly passionate about 
is the surrounding. It, it, it it's not doesn't make me cry, but it's made me sad. You know, I've got a hotel literally within that sort of, if you like, acreage that Manchester United own within that 60 acres, uh, 50 acres, whatever it is. And every time I look across that industrial wasteland and look across East Manchester and see what's being built, one of the best indoor music arenas in the world, one of the best uh, women's and youth stadiums, one of the best training grounds, one of the be most fantastic health and education centres. Um, and I think that there's been no development at all for 15, 20 years around Old Trafford. And I think, you know, you've got to win on the pitch as a football club, but you've got to win off the pitch. You've got to generate something around your ground that inspires the local community, that inspires the people, the hundreds of thousands and millions of people who come to Old Trafford every single year. There's jobs to be created, there's houses to be built, there's commercial buildings to be worked in, there's education and health and all those things that can happen, like a world of Manchester United, I've always called it. And I'm not saying they're the uses that are going to exist within this master plan, I have no idea, but when I was asked to form part of a group of people who would look at the regeneration of Old Trafford, I do feel it's where I can actually, to be fair, feel most passionate about. It's what I do in my sort of, if you like, non-football week you know I love property I love sort of developing stuff I've done it for 25 30 years of my life but I also love the idea of creating place and also building things that are really important to not just people who live in Manchester but people who come to Manchester and visit Manchester every single year so you know I'm proud to be part of it it's the I think only area that I would be part of that I could bring real sort of benefit to the club uh, and we'll see what happens in the next months and, 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 and years that obviously there's a lot of work to do and um, a lot of questions to answer. The one big question, and I know this is facile, it's too simple, but I think out there, me, just as a, as a lover of football, the question I want to say to you is, are we looking at a brand new Old Trafford or the old Old Trafford smartened up? I genuinely don't know. I think everybody knows that it's one of the two options. Either renovate and refurbish the existing Old Trafford or develop a brand new stadium next to Old Trafford. Um, no one knows the answer to that because to be fair one thing I won't do or ever disrespect one what are the costs what are the feasibility what are the possibilities um, what are the restrictions all those things that come into play and um, where would United play if they were refurbishing their own ground whilst they were playing I know that other ground you know other clubs have done it Real Madrid have done it um, in the last few years so but every stadium is different every structural solution is different so I think until you know you get into the actual sort of if you like meat of the work and and see what really um, is brought forward I don't think anybody's got that sort of answer I don't think that I think that's the reason that the group has been set up if you like to be able to actually help answer some of those questions but it'll come down to in the end the wills and wishes obviously the the, the work that goes on the the findings of the piece of work that goes on but it'll come down also in the end to the commercial aspects of it and what can be afforded because we know that a new stadium, well, the refurbishment of a stadium costs a lot of money, but we know the, refurb the, the building of a new stadium costs more. So I think that those are the questions that need answering in the next few months. OK, I was going to finish there, Gary, but I've just seen Jurgen Klopp being interviewed in front of us here. And uh, it occurs to me that before we finish, perhaps you'd like to have a, a final line on Klopp Guardiola. I mean, look, they're both exceptional managers. I've always swayed more towards Klopp because of just... He's obviously worked with great resource, resources here, but less resource than Pep Guardiola. Um, the style of play is more towards how I see football. Pep is an absolute genius, and what he's created at Bayern Munich, at Barcelona, and now at Manchester City is unequivocal. It's, it's incredible. But Klopp is a massive personality, a giant of a character and someone who is I think connects not just with his players that's pretty obvious and the staff within the club but with the city the language he uses the tone with obviously the fans and I think to me that's what a manager a great manager does they they, they do more than just play great football they do more than just win football matches they do more than win trophies they impact people's lives on a sort of daily basis, on a weekly basis. And I think Klopp does that for Liverpool. I think there are men and women and children in Liverpool who go to school, who wake up in the morning, who go to work, and they think of the passion and the energy of Jurgen Klopp. I genuinely think that will happen. I think Sir Alex Ferguson had that ability to connect with the fans at Old Trafford. And to me, 
he's a massive loss, obviously, to Liverpool. He's a massive loss to the Premier League uh, because there are very few like him, if any like him, in world football at this moment in time. I wish he was not the Liverpool manager and I can't wait for him to leave from a selfish perspective because I know whilst he's here, Liverpool stand a great uh, chance of success. And look, if, if we just go back to the start of the season, look at what everybody said about Liverpool and what their chances were of winning the title this season, including my own. The reason Liverpool are sat there in with the chance of winning the Premier League title is because of him. Honestly, he has that capability to be able to drag that extra percent, 2%, 3% out of a player that not many can. And that's why he's one of the great leaders. So, look, what we've seen it in the second half today. They've beaten up Manchester City in that second half. And that's one of the great teams that we'll ever see with a treble winning team with players that you couldn't admire anymore. So, you know, it, his interviews are always good, good value as well. Um, and we'll be really interesting to see what happens in the next few months. Um, because obviously they've won a trophy already. There's a feeling building here that they want to try and make it obviously a more special season than it already is with him leaving. Uh, and uh, yeah, exciting the last two or three months. I wish my football team was involved in the race, but it will come back soon, I'm sure, one day. Yeah, fabulous race. And it's, uh, it's on again in three weeks. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Peter. Cheers.